ಸರ್ ಶುರು ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಸರ್ ನರೀನ್ ಸರ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಸರ್ ಸೊ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರಗಳು ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ವರ್ಣ ಸೊ ಇಂದಿನ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಪ್ರತಿಭಾ ಶೋಧ ಯೋಜನೆಯ ಅರವತ್ತ ಎಂಟನೇ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಮಂಗಳೂರಿನ ಸೆಂಟ್ ಅಲೆಯಸ್ ಕಾಲೇಜಿನ ಪ್ರಾಧ್ಯಾಪಕರಾದಂತಹ ನವೀನ್ ಮಾಸ್ಕರೇಸ್ಟ್ ಅವರನ್ನ ಸ್ವಾಗತಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಐ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಯು ಸರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಸೊ ಅದೇ ರೀತಿ ಇಂದಿನ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ಹಾಜರಾಗಿರುವ ನನ್ನ ಎಲ್ಲ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಮಿತ್ರರು ಅಧ್ಯಾಪಕರು ಶಿಕ್ಷಕರು ಹಾಗೂ ನನ್ನ ಸಹೋದ್ಯೋಗಿಗಳನ್ನು ಕೂಡ ಈ ಒಂದು ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ಸ್ವಾಗತಿಸುತ್ತಾ ನಮ್ಮ ನವೀನ್ ಮಾಸ್ಕರೇಸರ್ ಅವರು ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಪ್ರತಿಭಾ ಸೌಧ ಯೋಜನೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಪದವಿ ಪೂರ್ವ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಗಳಿಗೆ ಹಲವಾರು ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಗಳನ್ನು ನೀಡಿದ್ದು ಅವರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಈಗಾಗಲೇ ನಾನು ಒಂದು ಕಿರು ಪರಿಚಯವನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದು ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಕಾಲಾವಕಾಶವು ಕಡಿಮೆ ಇರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಅವರನ್ನ ಈ ಒಂದು ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಪ್ರತಿಭಾ ಶೋಧ ಯೋಜನೆಯ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮದ ವೇದಿಕೆಗೆ ನಾನು ಬರ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಓವರ್ ಟಿ ಸರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಸೊ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸಿ ದಿಸ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಟುಡೇ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಸೆಮಿ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟರ್ ಇಲೆಕ್ಟ್ರಾನಿಕ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಸೆಮಿ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟರ್ ಡಿವೈಸಸ್ first of all let us try to understand the classification of solids we all know this i believe conductors insulators and semiconductors can uh, anybody give me examples for semiconductors any examples for semiconductors can we use the chat box anybody knows any examples for semiconductors no no okay so i'll give you silicon germanium correct no these are all examples of semiconductors okay when do we say you know in the band gap theory of solids when do we know that uh, solids are semiconductors if the band gap that is eg if it is less than 3 ev then we call it as semiconductors if it is greater than 3 ev it is referred as insulators and uh, if it is approximately zero or closer to zero then we call it as metals you know metals are very good conductors is it not there is no energy gap at all here energy gap when i say you must be knowing that there are two bands you know in the band structure the valence band and the conduction band if there is no energy gap between the two it is called conductor so the energy gap is above 3 ev it is insulator if it is less than 3 ev then it becomes semiconductor okay so this is what we need to know initially this number is very important okay 3 ev 3 ev correct so to identify you know that we are discussing semiconductors we restrict our uh, discussion in this uh, session only on semiconductors okay so what are the properties of semiconductors you all must be knowing by now that semiconductors are tetravalent what's the meaning of that valency is 4 which are the examples i gave for semiconductors just now silicon then germanium we can uh, try to find out how the valency is 4 by knowing its uh, which number atomic number is it now what's the atomic number of si anybody can uh, anybody can uh, put this in chat or uh, unmute and speak we write the electronic configuration based on atomic number what's the atomic number for silicon 
are all good chemistry students, so you must be knowing, right? Hmm. Fourteen, no? Fourteen. And of germanium, it is thirty-two. And uh, if I ask you to write the electronic configuration for silicon, it will be it will be one S two, two S two, two P six, three S two. And three P two. Why I stopped at uh, two here in P? Though we know that its uh, capacity is six, right? We we'll just count. Add two plus two is four. Four plus six is ten. Ten plus two is twelve. Twelve plus which number will give you fourteen, which is the required number? Only two, right? So I wrote two. Now how do I know that here the valency is four? Look at this outermost. Orbit. Count the number of electrons. Two plus two it is. So it's four. Anybody would like to tell me, unmute and tell me the electronic configuration for this 32? Thirty-two. Is it possible? No? One S2, two S2, two P6. Come on then, 3s2, surely 3p6 because it is 32 now, not 14. Then 4s2, this is a crucial one, what I should write now. It's only not a sp subshell, it is also d, no? 3d10, now count, 2 plus 2, 4, 4 plus 6, 10, 10 plus 2, 12, 12 plus 6, 18, 18 plus 2, 20, 20 plus 10, 30, and now 4p, 2. Now how the valence is 4 here again? Again, 4 you see, 4 is the outermost orbit. And what are the number of electrons in this? 2 plus 2, 4. So I said semiconductors are tetravalent, and I have not written one important one here. They are crystalline in structure. They have crystalline structure. Correct, no? If at all, if I have to draw silicon, it will be something like this. Nine dots we, we always draw and letters we draw, no? Crystalline structure. I can write plus four inside all and then uh, covalent bonds, no? Because what is the valency of each four, right? So like this we draw, right? Nice picture we get. You all are familiar with this crystalline structure. So semiconductors are crystalline in structure and are tetravalent. The next point that I've written here. Semiconductors have negative temperature coefficient. So alpha is negative. We all know that uh, for metals, for conductors, the temperature coefficient was positive. Alpha is positive. Alpha is nearly zero for very good uh, materials like, you know, uh, from which standard resistances are made. But for semiconductors, alpha is negative. What's the meaning? As temperature increases, resistance will not increase. That means it's positive alpha if it increases. Resistance decreases. So that's the meaning of this. Why? Because as temperature increases, bonds are broken. And when a bond is broken, bond is broken when temperature increases. When a bond is broken in semiconductors, electron hole pair is generated. Electron hole pair is generated. So, and these are free electrons, no? So, free electrons. Right? So, as the temperature increases, therefore, you know, you find that, you know, conductivity increases, which means resistivity decreases, resistance decreases. The only way we can increase the conductivity of a semiconductor is by increasing temperature right now. Then we know we can do it by adding impurities. That is called doping, no? So there are two ways in which I can increase the conductivity of a semiconductor. Which are those two ways? One is to increase the temperature. Other one is to add 
impurities. So these are the two methods by which we can increase the conductivity of a, a semiconductor. Okay. And then here I've written types. Which are the two types that we have in the semiconductors? Semiconductors, types. We know that there are two types possible, no? Intrinsic and extrinsic. Pure semiconductors are called intrinsic semiconductors. And doped semiconductors, when you add impurities, it becomes extrinsic semiconductors. So this is type of semiconductors based on pure and impure impurity. We can also classify semiconductors based on, you know, number of elements which are present as if there is only one element present, then it is elemental semiconductor. Example, silicon and germanium, they are, they are elemental semiconductors. But in this chapter, we also know we have compound semiconductors like gallium, arsenide, right? Gallium, phosphide, gallium, arsenide, phosphide. These are all used in the construction of LEDs, light emitting diodes. What's the full form of LED? Light emitting diodes. May we discuss even these compound semiconductors. So based on uh, the type of elements present, uh, number of elements present, we have elemental semiconductors and compound semiconductors. Based on the purity, we have uh, intrinsic semiconductor and extrinsic semiconductor. So how to increase the conductivity of an in intrinsic semiconductor? This is a this is the picture which I've shown here down now here. This is a picture of a intrinsic semiconductor. So how to increase the conductivity of this? Two ways. One is to increase the temperature. Other one is to, other one is to add impurities. Dope. That's called doping. Okay. But doping, we can always, you know, increase the conductivity. It is like a getting ready to or getting warmed up for a game you know when you you should not play any game before without warming up as we warm up what happens our temperature increases and therefore the conductivity of us also will increase because you know we can play better right so that is one way of increasing the conductivity other one is to add dopants that's what we do you know, many times some are taking the external help you know they they dope themselves to increase their conductivity, but that is not the right way actually, correct? No, in games I'm saying, but here that is the best way. In semiconductors, the best way of increasing the conductivity is to dope, get doped, right? So by adding, adding impurity atoms, we can increase the conductivity drastically. And that is extrinsic semiconductor. So if at all, if you know what are extrinsic semiconductors, they are nothing but doped to semiconductors. So doped semiconductors are extrinsic. Okay. In intrinsic semiconductors, we can write one formula, right? N number of electrons and number of holes are always equal. And that is called Ni, let's say. Intrinsic carrier concentration. Why they are equal? Because in intrinsic semiconductors, when the temperature increases, we don't dope in intrinsic, remember. When temperature increases, electron hole pairs are formed. If 50 bonds are broken, 50 electrons are there, free electrons, 50 holes are there. Correct? Therefore, we say conductivity in an intrinsic semiconductor is not only due to electrons, it is also due to holes. But contribution is equal. Correct? No. Conductivity in intrinsic semiconductor is due to both electrons as well as holes. What is hole? Anybody know what is a hole? What is a hole? Hole is an imaginary particle said to have positive charge, exists outside the nucleus, only in semiconductors. I, I said so many things. Now, hole is a Imaginary entity, nobody has seen an electron. We can only feel for an electron. So just imagine, therefore, what is a hole? Hole is an imaginary entity 
said to have positive charge, surely, because electron can fill this vacancy. So therefore, it should have a positive charge. It is said to have a positive charge. It exists outside the nucleus. You all know it. It cannot be inside the nucleus, it, but only in semiconductors. Do we have uh, holes in, uh, I'm not talking about the physical holes that are present, remember? These are the holes that we talk about only in semiconductors, right? Exists outside the nucleus. We don't have holes in uh, conductors as well as insulators, right? So that is all about intrinsic semiconductors. This is a formula, N is equal to NH into Ni. But the same formula for extrinsic will be Ne into NH will be equal to Ni square. Okay. The number of electrons and holes when you multiply, it will be equal to Ni square. And what is Ni? Is the number of intrinsic carried con concentration of a pure semiconductor. Okay. So this formula will hold good for extrinsic semiconductor, whether it is P-type semiconductor or N-type semiconductor. So there are two types of extrinsic semiconductors. What are extrinsic, I said? Doped semiconductors, no? So by, by choosing a proper dopant, we can make either P-type or N-type. Okay. By adding, uh, what is the valency of uh, intrinsic semiconductors? Semiconductor tetravalent, you said. One valency less and one valency more. So by adding pentavalent, we get n type semiconductors. Pentavalent, like, uh, you know, phosphorus and so on. We get, uh, we get uh, n type semiconductors. Similarly, by adding uh, trivalent impurity atoms, trivalent. Trivalent means valency is three, unless we get P-type semiconductors. Like for example, gallium, aluminum, indium, all these are examples of P-type. For N-type, I said phosphorus, you know, bismuth, arsenic, antimony, all these are N-type semiconductors. Here is a picture. See here. Remember in this picture, some things are missing. Which are the things which are missing? Silicon atoms are not shown. This, this what is shown is a, is a pentavalent, let's say, phosphorus ion. Because it has donated one electron. Because it had a valency 5, no? To bond with silicon atoms, we require, require only 4. So the one which is free, okay, one which is fifth is available in the conduction band, you know, easily at room temperature. That's how for every plus ion, phosphorus ion, we have one free electron. So these are all symbols of electron. So if there are 50 phosphorus atoms added, there will be 50 electrons. If we add 1,000 phosphorus atoms, then there will be 1,000 electrons at room temperature. And that's why we have now electrons in majority. Let's say due to temperature, this is due to doping, no? Due to temperature, let's say only 10, uh, I'm taking only a small example, don't, don't think that it will be 1,000 and all, it will be huge number. But to understand it's easy, 10 bonds are broken, let's say, then there will be 10 electrons and 10 holes, right? So altogether, how many electrons are there now? 50 plus 10, 60, but holes are only 10. So electron number will become more than the hole number. Or if you take 1,000, 1,000 plus 10 is 1,010 totally. But the hole number is only 10. So who are in majority now? Electrons are in majority, holes are in minority in a in n-type semiconductor. That's why the name N type N. These electrons are in majority. Electron majority. And what's the charge assumed for an electron always? Negative. That's why it's N type. Don't think that the charge on N type semiconductor is negative. So this is electrically neutral. Both N type semiconductor as well as 
P-type semiconductors are electrically neutral. Why? Anybody would like to answer that question? Why N-type and P-type semiconductors are electrically neutral? Because to make n-type, we did not add uh, electrons or we never removed electrons. No, we added atoms. Which atoms we added? Pentavalent uh, phosphorus atoms we added, let's say. And don't you think that phosphorus atoms are also electrically neutral? Correct, no? So there is no extra electron which has come anywhere to make it negatively charged. These electrons have come because, you know, the phosphorus atom was not able to bond with all its electrons with the silicon. Silicon, what were the number of electrons available? Outermost, four. Phosphorus, how many available? Five. Out of this five, only four could bond with this. One was free. Correct, no? But this entire thing goes of the phosphorus, right? So remember, we never added extra electrons. We added only atoms which were electrically neutral. Therefore. Charge of N-type semiconductor is neutral. Charge of P-type is also neutral. There is a spelling mistake here. Type Semiconductor N, semiconductor P this is. So similarly P now, if you are seeing P, imagine gallium. Gallium is having a valency 3. What is the valency of silicon? 4. So there is one shortage now. What will happen? The shortage will be filled Shortage will be a hole. If I have to show you the picture, I can show the picture maybe here. Let's say this is the plus three one. So only three are there here. There is absence here, no? So there are neighboring silicon atoms, right? This is gallium at the center. Let's say this electron at room temperature fills this. But it was inside the bond. No, the bond is broken here. When the bond is broken. Definitely, hole is also created there. Correct, no? So, electron hole, that electron has filled here. That means this will become stable now. But since this gallium attracted one electron from the neighboring silicon, it becomes a negative ion. That's what is shown in this picture. See? Every every gallium atom which was added to make a p-type semiconductor becomes a negative ion, and it gives rise to one hole. And hole is set to a positive charge. Therefore, I am showing plus. Do you think that p-type semiconductor has only this? No. In addition to this, there will be electron hole pairs here also. Electron hole pairs. And this is because of temperature, no? This is due to temperature. Somewhere it will be there. And also we can draw. So this is your N-type and P-type semiconductor. So now questions before we move further. Anybody answer? What is the charge of P-type semiconductor? What is the charge on P-type semiconductor? Nobody is answering. Positive. Very good. Somebody has answered already, right? Swati. Very nice. But is it positive? No. Charge on P-type semiconductor is it? No charge. Electrically neutral, you should say. Why? Because we added not electrons. We never removed also electrons. We added atoms. No. To make p-type semiconductors to silicon crystal, what did I add? Impurity atoms. Which impurity atoms? Trivalent. The gallium, aluminium, indium. Correct? No. So, therefore, 
it is electrically neutral, not positive. So you need to get this one right. Okay, next question. How do I make a n-type semiconductor? This is easy. How do I make a n-type semiconductor from intrinsic semiconductor? Add pentavalent impurity atoms. Perfect, Swati. This time you are right. Correct. Add pentavalent impurity atoms to make a n-type semiconductor. Perfect. Good. Pentavalent impurity atoms like phosphorus, I said. Now, here is a picture of a PN junction. Why this PN junction is so important? It was given by Russell All. People have forgotten his name. Will remember some other names. Some other name is the inventor of a diode, remember. Of course, this PN junction itself becomes a diode later on. But uh, the person who invented this PN junction is Russell All. Okay. He did a very good job of giving us a PN junction because a P as it is or N as it is has no application. Application comes only when we have we have a uh, PN junction. And the moment a PN junction is formed, PN junction is this. See, this is N type. This is P type. Again, you see this. This region from here to here, is it neutral? Yes. From here to here, is it neutral? The answer is again yes. Okay. Fine. But what is the answer to the charge of this region? Yeah, this side it is positive. See, only positive it is. This side is negative. You can see also from the battery, you know, lines here. Why? Because the moment the P and N were fused electrically, electrons which are present here combined with the holes which are present here, therefore they disappeared. Electrons and holes in that region got disappeared, leaving behind only the only the ions, positive ions here and negative ions here. That means a field was set up, electric field was set up, and that field was from positive to negative this way. Electric field is set up. Okay. So try to understand, therefore. So this this region is referred as space charge region because it is a charged region. But these regions are not charged, and they prevent uh, actually the further crossing over of electrons and holes. Why? Because negative doesn't get uh, attracted by the positive potential which is there this side. Positive here. And uh, the the, the uh, electrons which want to cross over this side are getting repelled by the negative potential which is there this side. Holes are also getting repelled. So therefore, a stable equilibrium stage is reached. All that we say, but try to understand there are two currents which we need to discuss here. And uh, nobody, you know, hardly you all give importance to all this, but I give importance to this. As, uh, as we read from uh, H.C. Verma, we will get to understand that these are the two currents what we need to know. So let me draw a P and very simple one, P and N. We know that this is full of electrons, N side. And this is full of holes. And the diffusion is because of the density gradients. No? This side is full of electrons. This side is less of electrons. This side is full of holes. This side is less of holes. So to balance, therefore, obviously, the diffusion has to happen. Electrons should cross over this way. And holes should cross over this way. And this gives rise to a current, uh, which we know as diffusion current. 
Remember, current is always the direction in which the positive charge tends to move. The positive charge is always hold, not in the direction of holes, no, but opposite in the direction of holes. Electron moves this way, but therefore the current direction should be opposite. Okay. And this is diffusion current. It is from P to N. What about drift? Drift current. Drift current is happening in this depletion region. You all know that this is space charge region, also called as depletion region. Why? In this region, no, there are no free electrons and holes. Even when they are created also, they are swept away or they are, the bonds are broken, means electron hole pairs are formed here. But they are swept away because of the electric field that exists. Just imagine electron hole pair forming here. There is an electric field here, no? Which is from uh, positive to negative. So electrons experience a force in a direction opposite to the field. And hole experiences a force in a direction along the field. So this hole moves this way. And uh, electrons move in a direction opposite the field is what we know. Correct now. So that gives rise to a current called drift current. That is happening in the depletion region. If I have to redraw this graph, let me erase this and redraw it for you once again with the PN. Diffusion is very clear. It's because of the density gradient. The majority electrons are crossing over. And now this is again PN. This is the depletion region that we have in which the majority charge carriers, which are electrons here and which are holes here are absent here, depleted off. Okay. So the moment uh, the bonds are broken, the electrons and holes, they move in a direction which is which is not along the field, but opposite to the field. So that gives rise to a current called diffusion current. So at equilibrium, when a PN junction is said to be formed, when current due to diffusion is must be equal to current due to drift. Current due to diffusion must be, you know, current due to drift. Okay. So then only we say, please understand in P side we have oh, here like this, okay. Accept rayons and here we had donor ions and therefore this was N here and this is P here, remember. Similarly here also. So direction of electric field is this way. When a Electron hole pair is generated here inside this because of temperature. Electron experiences a force not along the direction of the field, but opposite of the field. That means it moves this way from P to N. Hole moves this way. Therefore, the direction of drift current is this. Direction of diffusion current was this, P to N. But this is N to P. This is P to N. Opposite, no, they are. So when they become equal in magnitude, the net current becomes zero, right? Net current is zero. And that's when we say a PN junction is formed. So PN junction is formed when the diffusion current is equal to the drift current. Diffusion current is due to the density gradient of electrons and holes. Electrons are rich here, holes are rich here. Correct now. So the direction of diffusion is from here to here. Draw a big arrow if you want. This is diffusion current. Okay, but when electron hole pairs are formed here inside, hole, how it is moving, direction of electric field is this. Same way, no hole experience of force along the direction of the field. So that is the direction of drift current now, this one. This is current due to drift. Are they in the same direction? No. But when uh, PN junction is said to be formed when current due to drift 
is equal to current due to diffusion. So now, before I proceed, question. Let's see who will answer now. Not able to see the chat. Okay. Oh, uh, I don't know. Something is stuck with my pen. Is it because of this diagram? Give me a minute. Doesn't matter. Not able to see, but okay. Somebody tell me, therefore. Someone tell me now. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the direction of diffusion current? And what's the direction of drift current? Well, now I'm able to see. Okay. Anybody can answer. Swati was answering so far. Let's see. Diffusion current direction. Diffusion is because of the majority charge carriers. Direction of electric field is thus in the space charge region from positive to negative. When an electron hole pair is generated here, electron will move in a direction opposite to the field. But hole will move in a direction along the field. That means hole is moving from, remember this is N side, this is P side. So your drift current is from N to P. Whereas your diffusion current is from P to N. Please don't forget this. You can't go wrong, you know. And when the when the p-injection is said to be formed, these two currents must be equal. These two currents must be equal. Okay. Fine. So good. So let's move to now the next topic, therefore. If there are no questions, let's see. The question is no. Biasing. Applying external voltage is called biasing, actually. Applying external. We had internal voltage. We saw that. That's a barrier potential was there. It is uh, 0 0.6 EV, uh, sorry, 6 volt for silicon, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 for silicon. And for germanium diode and all, it becomes 0.3 volt or 0 0.2. 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. Okay. Now, this is not that internal one. This is external. That is called biasing. How many ways we can bias a diode? What is diode actually now? This is a diode symbol. You all know it. Same P and junction, P and N, with electrodes, man. Anode cathode. This is anode, this is cathode. This becomes a PN junction diode. That's called semiconductor diode because it's made up of semiconductor, no? And this diode has plenty of applications. You all know it. We can't think of uh, the modern life without these semiconductor devices because we are living in a semiconductor world. You may say we are living in a chip world. The chip is all of semiconductors. And inside these chips, all we have are diodes and transistors is what we are studying in this, you know, important stage. So again, PUC physics. Apply an external voltage. So the way we apply, we have two bias, forward bias and reverse bias. When do we say P and junction is forward bias? When the P is connected to positive of the external battery and N is connected to negative of the external battery. Anybody? Reverse bias now? Reverse bias. 
T is connected to negative and N is connected to positive. This is reverse bias. And uh, the, the characteristics of uh, this forward bias and reverse bias, it is given in always the first and the third quadrant in a graph sheet. Because this is positive voltage, this will be negative voltage. And that's what we know. If this is positive voltage, then definitely this is a negative voltage. And current direction also, not the same direction, you see. Here the current flows from, you all know how the current flows in electric current. They have taught you from higher potential to lower potential. So in the semiconductor, it is from P to N. Which means what we had now, very crucial this is. We had eye diffusion and eye drift current, no inside the junction. Which one do you think, they were equal. Which one do you think increases now? Drastically, which one? Diffusion current uh, after forward biasing. Whether diffusion and drift current remains the same or they change. They change, surely. Which one increases, which one decreases? Or you know, decrease, it can remain the same also. Which one, which one is affected? If you're able to answer in terms of diffusion and drift current, I think you have understood this biasing, you know, to a greater extent. Not to the same extent as we all understand by reading the simple text. Remember, diffusion increases by a great percentage. Okay. And drift remains almost the same because drift is due to the due to the temperature, no. And electric field, right, which is there inside the charge space charge region, which is not affected much. The width of the depletion region has decreased only. Okay. But there is, it's a it's a slight change. So therefore, drift to current, uh, you know, has uh, decreased or it remains almost the same, but diffusion increases drastically. And that's why now there is a net current, no? From where to division was always from P to N, remember. And drift current is always from N to P. But this has remained almost the same or slightly decreased, but this has increased drastically. That's the direction of current that I'm showing here. Okay. So there's current here. What about here? In this, can we speak about diffusion and uh, drift? Here, the diffusion is impossible. Diffusion is not uh, increasing. It is actually decreasing. But here, this one is almost the same. Earlier it was, see, remember, uh, these are in microamperes, this current, you know. But uh, when uh, during forward bias, the current increased from um, microampere to milliampere. But here, now what is the net of this? Net will become still smaller than the, what it was earlier drift. This current will be very small of the order of microamperes. And that's what we know in this characteristic. You should know that this y-axis here is in microampere and this is in milliampere. But these are both in volts. But one is positive potential, other one is negative potential. So this is what we get. In fact, of course, we don't get till here because this region is called breakdown region. Breakdown will kill the PN junction permanently. We cannot use it anymore. So we use it only till here, this voltage maybe. Maybe this itself is 30 volt, enough. Minus 30, surely. This is known as the cutting voltage or knee voltage. And this voltage is what I wrote that time, 0.6 EV for silicon and 0.2 EV for germanium. If at all, if the base uh, is uh, germanium, then 0.2 you get. If the base was silicon and then you doped it, then it becomes 0.6 EV, this value. Knee voltage or cutting voltage. Cutting voltage is the forward voltage at which diode begins to conduct. See this, this one. Current is in milliamperes. This is the breakdown voltage at which the PN junction is spoiled. The voltage that is minus 50 is shown here. It's a reverse voltage, not the forward voltage at which junction breakdown takes place. Okay, so these are the characteristics. Application of diode. 
we use it for rectification. What is rectification? What is rectification according to you? Converting AC to pulsating DC, not perfect DC, pulsating DC. This is a pulse here. Can you see? This is pulsating. See here also pulsating. Of course, this is full wave rectification, and this one is half wave rectification. If the output current or voltage exists only for one half cycle, you are only for positive half cycle, the output is there. This is the input. No, this is the output. And we use the diode. Here, one diode. Here, how many diodes are used? Two diodes are used. This is half wave rectifier. And this one is full wave rectifier. Correct? So converting AC to pulsating DC is what we refer as rectification. All right. So if at all, if they ask you how much DC is there in the output of uh, half a rectifier, the answer is, you know, V0 by I. And here, how much is there, sir? 2 V0 by I. Two times. So this is a better rectification, full rectifier, than half wave rectifier. Okay. Fine. Rectification is nothing but converting AC to pulsating DC, because uh, most of our instrument, even your mobile charger and all, it is it wants only DC, no. But what we get we are, get to our, get to our, get in our house is AC. So there is a there is a charger unit which converts that AC to DC. But what is that component which which converts alternating current current in two directions to only current flowing in one direction? That's a diode, because diode conducts only when it is forward biased and it doesn't conduct when it is reverse biased. That's a property that is made use of. So if at all if you want to know which property of the diode. You now converts AC to pulsating DC. It is a property that diode conducts only in this direction. No, the current. This this way current flows. No, of course there is current called microamperes, but this current is in milliampere. What is microampere compared to milliampere? Thousand times smaller. It is like one rupee and thousand rupees, which is the money in this. Thousand rupees is the money. One rupee is nothing in front of thousand rupees. If I distribute these two to two students in the class, the one which, who got one rupee will return it to me because this person has got thousand rupees. You see, that's the difference between microampere and milliampere. Try to understand milliampere is nothing in front of milliampere. Microampere is nothing in front of milliampere. Therefore, there is, this is not current at all. This is only due to minority charge carriers, whereas this one is due to majority charge carriers. Before I proceed to special diodes, if I ask you, can you distinguish between P-type and uh, N-type semiconductor? What are the, you know, two columns if I have to fill? How to get P-type? By doping with trivalent. One I will give you. This one, pentavalent. Any other differences? You can think of. Hmm? In P type, who is greater, who is smaller? In terms of you know mobile charge carriers. Three electrons and holes. Number of holes is greater than number of electrons here. See? That's why P type. In N type, Number of electrons is much greater than number of holes. But of course, the formula is very clear. Any into NH must be equal to Ni square. Ni is when the when it was not doped. What is the carrier concentration? Number of electrons and holes were equal, no? That square. Any into NH will be always equal to Ni square. Okay. 
here conductivity is due to mainly due to holes here the conductivity is mainly due to electrons okay and here who are the majority charge carriers holes where are they they are in the valence band holes are in valence band whereas who are the charge carriers here majority electrons and where are they they are in the conduction band so this is the conduction band this is the valence band the donor impurity level will be closer to the conduction band of the of the pentavalent impurity atoms whereas the acceptor level is closer to the closer to the valence band acceptor level this is donor level donor level of you know pentavalent plus 5 this is of plus 3 So these are the differences that we all know, we should know of P-type and N-type. Now we need to discuss some uh, special diodes, Zener, LED, photodiode and solar cell. Now, this is the symbol of Zener. Many times I keep asking, what is this symbol, uh, two lines like this? And you are saying that this is Z, no sir. Zener starts with uh, Z. Uh, Scientist who invented. No, 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 no. This is how the characteristic curve will appear of the Zener. That's why I love this. I have to draw again. See, so this is our I and uh, V. This is how the characteristic curve will be. Reverse bias. Zener diode conducts during reverse bias. That's a speciality of Zener. Whereas uh, diode conducts only during forward bias. Zener diode conducts both during forward bias and reverse bias. And when it is specially used under reverse bias, and it is used as voltage regulator. Getting a constant output voltage. So Zener is always used under Reverse bias means this is P-type connected to negative and N-type connected to positive. Output voltage across the Zener will be almost a constant and which is equal to the Zener voltage called breakdown voltage. Yes, Zener is going to operate very safely in the, in the breakdown region but not the semiconductor diode. Zener diode is designed to operate in the breakdown region. What makes it so special, sir? Why it is uh, made to operate in the Zener uh, breakdown region, which is special, uh, our ordinary diode is not capable of? Remember, Zener is heavily doped. Heavily doped. Not like our ordinary diode, which is moderately doped. Zener is heavily doped. That's the property which allows it to operate safely in the in the breakdown region. Its depletion region is thin compared to ordinary diode. For even a slight increase in the width of the depletion region, electric intensity increases drastically, and the bonds are broken, and therefore the the you know current rises sharply. This is also in milliamperes. This is also in milliamperes, whereas in uh, in uh, ordinary diode this was in microamperes. No, 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 no. Zener conducts even during reverse bias. So name a diode which conducts in both the directions if they ask you none of these except only Zener. Okay. Zener is the only diode which can conduct both in forward bias as well as reverse bias. Light emitting diode. Among these three, no, LED, photo and solar, similarities are these or differences are these. This is the only one which converts electric energy to light energy. Whereas these two convert light energy to electric energy, both photodiode as well as solar cell. LED converts electric energy to light energy. So to construct a LED, we cannot construct a LED with elemental semiconductors. We need to have a compound semiconductors and the energy gap 
EG required is at least 1.8 EV. So this is one more number which we should remember. What is the energy gap of uh, silicon? 1.1 EV. Is it en enough? No, no, no. 1.8 minimum I need, I said, no. What is the energy gap of germanium? 0.6, sorry, 7 EV. Is that also enough? No. So we need, therefore, these uh, compound semiconductors like gallium arsenide, whose, uh, whose energy gap will be 1.8 EV or above. 1.9 EV also will do, yeah, but less than 3 EV. Those are all called semiconductors, no less than 3 EV. So, so this can be thought of as the light emitting diodes. Okay. And when the light is emitted, only when the diode is powered by asked. But you need to make use of not element semiconductors, but compound semiconductors. Photodiode. Photodiode is again operated under reverse bias, like how Zener is also operated under reverse bias to get the very important applications called regulation. Even photodiode is also operated under reverse bias. Actually, under reverse bias, there is no current, no? But when light of suitable intensity and wavelength is you know, impressed on the photodiode, photodiode, P and N, there is a depletion, there is a glass window here. So light is made to fall. When the light is made to fall, more bonds are broken and current will flow. Current will flow. And that's where it is It is uh, important. Okay. So if I to show you the characteristics uh, curve of uh, photodiode, Photodiode characteristics, something like this, only reverse bias. So when there is no light intensity, intensity is zero, no light intensity, it's called dark current. This current is called dark current. When light of suitable intensity is falling, you know, as the intensity increases, even the strength of the current also will increase. So if I call this as I1, I2, I3, surely I3 is having more intensity than I2 than I1 because the strength of the currents are increasing. This is photodiode. Solar cell, all of you know, okay. Solar cell doesn't require an external cell, whereas photodiode requires an external cell. I don't know whether I've drawn it at that time. This is your uh, solar cell, oh, sorry, P and uh, photodiode. It should be reverse biased, I said, no. And there's a glass window. But solar cell, that itself is a cell. It's a PN junction, but acts as a cell. Doesn't require an external cell. And light energy gets converted into electric energy. Okay. Construction and other things are there, but then it is not so important when it comes to our CET. So transistor. Next topic, and I would like to finish this as well in another five minutes. Transfer resistor, this is. So this is uh, to be transfer resistor. It is actually transferring resistance, no, transferring electrons from, from low resistance to, to high resistance region. So that's, this is the principle behind amplification, remember. To get amplification, you must push the electrons from low resistance region to high resistance region. Now, how do we get low resistance region? If you forward bias. Forward bias, low resistance always. Reverse bias, high resistance. That's why in transistor, there are two junctions, okay? One has to be forward bias, one has to be reverse biased. Then only push electrons from forward bias region to reverse bias region. Then only you can get the application of transistor, that is amplification. If at all, if I, if anybody wants to know in simple ways, what is amplification? Very simple. In transistor, which is a two junction device, N, P, N. So P material is sandwiched between the two N materials. It's called NPN transistor. Here is one junction, no, junction one, junction two. 
So forward bias T junction uh, one and reverse bias junction two. Simple. You can get the amplification. If you don't do this, you will not be able to get it at all. So then you may ask if I forward bias both the junctions, what will happen here? And also there is something, it will act as an on switch. Transistor can act as a switch, you know. And uh, the most beautiful thing is it acts as an on switch when both its junctions are forward biased. If junction one is forward biased, that is this junction is forward biased. You know what is forward biased, no? Connecting N to negative and P to positive. That's forward bias. And if so this one is reverse bias, then it is amplification, I said. Amplification. This is on switch. If both are reverse biased, if both the junctions are reverse biased, as I write here, that means here, connect to this way. N to positive, P to negative, P to negative, N to positive. This is both reverse bias. Then it is acting like an off switch. So which means transistor can act as a switch as well as amplifier. When transistor acts as an amplifier, when uh, it's emitter, this is emitter region, this is base region, and this is collector region. When emitter base junction is powered by asked, emitter base junction is forward by asked, and collector base junction is reverse by asked, then it can act as an amplifier. When it acts as a switch, when both these junctions are powered by asked or reverse by asked. But never we should do the other one. Which one? Emitter base junction reverse by us and ask for an application. No application is there. And collector base junction is forward by us. If you keep it like this for a long time, your transistor only gets spoiled because you're done uh, the biasing to destroy the transistor because transistor has not equal doping and uh, equal size for all these three regions, you know, emitter, collector, base. So you should never do this inverse mode. So no application because of this. So very clear, therefore, in transistor, we have two junctions and the two junctions are to be appropriately biased depending on the application. If the application is to amplify, then which kind of biasing we need to do? Emitter base junction should be forward biased. Collector base junction should be reverse biased. If you want it to act like a switch, in switch again, there are two switches on and off. You know what is on switch and what is off switch, no? On switch means current is maximum. Voltage across the switch is minimum. Off switch means Current is minimum, but voltage across the switch is maximum. Your uh, switch in the house also, same thing. When you, but of course, don't think that transistor, that is transistor, that is a mechanical switch. This is electronic switch. Transistor can act as an on switch as well as off switch. But both the junctions are either forward biased or reverse biased. Both forward biased, on switch, both reverse biased, off switch. Logic gates. The gates which, uh, you know, do some logic. Gates are nothing but circuits, okay? Electronic circuits. Something that they are all made up of diodes and uh, transistors and resistors. Resistors are always there. Diodes and transistors. All these components are connected together to make an electronic circuit, which is a gate. So the electronic circuit which performs some logic is called a logic gate. The logic gate can have one or many inputs, but a single output, no? Single output. So this is the symbol of a AND gate. This is a symbol of a OR gate. And NOT gate is the only gate which has a single input and single output. These are called basic gates. Then we have two more gates called universal gates using which the remaining gates can be constructed. And that is nothing but to add, no, you should add at the output to not. So bubble, not is this actually, but I, I avoid this, only bubble. So this becomes your NAND gate, not a AND gate. Similarly, this is OR gate. You 
bubble it, then it becomes a NOR gate. So these are called universal gates. Then there are two more gates called exclusive gates, XOR, XOR, or simply write XOR plus, or XNOR, or just night plus X. These are all exclusive gates. Symbol of that also can be written. Uh, this is a symbol of one more curve should come here. This is one. I will ask you to name it one more here. This is all. With one more line, it becomes, if I give it to him, then it is difficult. No? XOR. Whereas this is NOR, no, already, and this one more. This becomes XOR. Okay, these are the logic gates that we have. And uh, yeah, you know maybe what is uh, OR logic, what is NAND logic, what is NOT logic, all that. It's very simple. By the name only we can make out, no? For example, if I have to write uh, for two inputs, A and B, both inputs can be low. Low means connected to zero volt. A one can be connected to five volt. Five volt means logic one, one zero, one one. Output is called truth table, okay? Output of OR gate, if I have to write, it will be this way. Output is high. High means high voltage. If any one of the input was high, A or B, that's why OR gate, AND gate. Output is high if A and B is high. That means for 1, 1 only, you can get the output 1. Remaining, it should be 0. And for NOT gate, it is a different. Uh, output is not the input, no? If input is 0 volt, output is 5 volt. If input is 5 volt, output is 0 volt. This is not gate. So you can think of a NAND. NAND is not AND, no. Not AND means what it should be. It cannot be 0, 0, 0, 1. It has to be 1, 1, 1, 0. Similarly for NOR, it cannot be 0, 1, 1, 1. It has to be 1, 0, 0, 0. So this is your logic gate. I think uh, that I will stop. If I have any questions, you know, I can take. Any questions? So, anyone is there? From KSTA, host. Swati, you have any question? These are all, uh, I mean, logic gate is a book. So here it's only one page. Similarly, transistor is a book as you study further your engineering or higher studies. So we introduce only little in uh, PUC level to give you to find out you know, whether you are interested in pursuing the studies in these topics further. So everything is introduced at the PUC level. Remember, this becomes the base to study you know, either computer science or electronics further. The entire computer science is based on uh, logic gates. Correct. Right? Entire computer is built uh, using logic gates. And uh, the remaining uh, electronics that we study. Right. So without the logic, there is no program. Right. Logic is the heart of the computer program. So we try to develop all these interests in the PU level so that you know you will will pick up these topics in future. I'm done. If there are no questions, I think we can wind up. So chat box are other questions, sir. Later on I sent through my email, sir. Sure, sir, sure, sure. Any question is the Kali sir. Answer okay, okay, sir. Anyway, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I would like to uh, thank immensely uh, for delivering a, a very good uh, informative and uh, insightful talk uh, 
and today's topic makkalige bari sadalithavagi ee ondu upanasya karyakramavanna bari saralavagi halavaru udaharanagala mukantara tilisukottidira sir so we have a case here and myself thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you hagu indu hajaragida nanna ella vidyarthi mitraru sahodyogigalu hagu adhyapakargalige kuda dhanyavadagalanu tilisutta ee ondu upanasya karyakramavanna ಮುಗಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದೇವೆ ನಾಳಿನ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮವು ಎಂದಿನಂತೆ ಸಂಜೆ ನಾಲ್ಕು ಗಂಟೆಗೆ ಆರಂಭವಾಗಲಿದ್ದು ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಗಳು ಹೆಚ್ಚಿನ ಸಂಖ್ಯೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಹಾಜರಾಗಿ ಸಂಪನ್ಮೂಲ ವ್ಯಕ್ತಿಗಳು ಕೊಡುವಂತ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆಗಳಿಗೆ ಉತ್ತರಗಳನ್ನು ನೀಡುತ್ತಾ ಅಥವಾ ಹಾಜರಾಗ್ಬೇಕೆಂದು ನಮ್ಮ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಮತ್ತು ತಂತ್ರಜ್ಞಾನ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ವತಿಯಿಂದ ತಿಳಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವನಡಾ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಪ